This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 109. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Kevin Moyer. I'm Jamie D. I'm Peter Rios. What's, what are you mumbling I over I said there? we should have pulled a Daredevil clip. Yeah, yeah I know. We didn't have time. <laughs> uh, welcome to Comic Geek Speak. Uh, this episode, is, you guys are laughing, you know? <laughs> Peter's over here, like, totally bald, just cracking up. Sorry. <laughs> All right. This episode of Comic Geek Speak is sponsored by the New York City Comic Con. This weekend, February 24th, 25th, and 26th at the Jacob Javits Center in New York City. We will be attending, as will almost every creator on the earth. The list is huge. Uh, I can't even bear Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Brian every, yeah, everybody. Yeah, uh, Brian true. Bendis is going to be there now. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. It's Gene Peter Colin. Scolari. Yeah, Gene, 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 Gene Colin. Yeah. Peter Scolari from Blues <laughs> Buddies. He, I mean, it's endless. Everybody. I mean, it is. It's amazing. <clears throat> the freaking jam-packed is professionals and Top creators. Top shelf. Mercury Comics. Uh, Comic. Atomica. Um, I'm digging it, man. I really am. Mm-hmm. I hope it's successful, and I hope it really people really come out and really enjoy what they put together, and, and it and it keeps going. Chris and that, Batista, and that, and that's really what it's all about. It's about you going out there to the show and supporting and it supporting and it because if you don't, it doesn't matter who they bring; they're not going to come back. Yeah, exactly. won't. Yeah, they already said they're going to lose money, but if they lose too much money, they may not do it again next year. So. We got to they got we got to get them. It's just like anything else. If you want it, you got to support it. Ass is in the seats, as they say. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So anyway, come out and buy and, some comics. And hang out with us. Check it out. Yeah. Buy our T-shirt. Out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> buy our shit. <laughs> <laughs> buy our stuff. Uh, yeah, we don't have a lot of time to to screw around here. Dilly we dally. we just what's that? To dilly dally. That's right. We just did uh, an interview with. Ed Brubaker and Michael Lark, the creative team on the uh, new Daredevil series. Well, not new series, but new new run of Daredevil. And uh, so here are the guys. We should let them know. Say, oh. Spoilers, yeah. spoilers, spoilers. Yeah, there yeah is if you haven't, we... it doesn't spoil anything that hasn't come out yet. No. But if you haven't read Daredevil, there's spoilers. Consider so. this kind of like an off the rack kind of interview, you know? It's like Basically, yeah. Extended... Yes. Mm-hmm. It's not real in depth. It's not real right. deep as far as you know, getting real into the topics and into what's going on. But there's yeah, a general discussion good. about everything. So, here we go. Here it is. Hey guys. Hey. Excellent. All right, uh, I'm here with Kevin, Jamie, and Peter. Hello. Hello. Hey guys. How you doing? Oh, all right. It's good to hear your voice, stranger. <laughs> no one knows who to sp- how. To, which one should speak first. <laughs> And it's always you that should speak first. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That's how it goes. Well, that's what it usually ends up being anyway. <laughs> Isn't always the writer before the artist? It should be, really. <laughs> Ouch. Writers usually have more to say anyway, at least. At least they think they do, right? Yeah, yeah. but who gets final say over the artwork? I mean, over the comic book when it's done. You know, I mean, it's like they can write Tell all the us. script. They can write all the script they want, we and we go. just ignore it anyway. <laughs> yeah, it gives them the illusion of being in power. So, Ed, we want to um, welcome like you, Dick Cheney, to my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not go down that path. No, <laughs> we'll no. never get out of it. Ed, we want to um, welcome you to the show for the first time. We're glad you're with us. Oh, thanks. Has Michael been on before? Yes, uh, we had the opportunity. Well, actually, Ed's been on before, too. He was on briefly oh. with the Chicago show, but this is the first time he's been on sober. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thanks. Can we say that? Well, actually, are you sober? I am, actually, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm surprised. <laughs> 14 days now, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> am I sober? I'm almost always sober. Uh-huh. Mike, are you oh, a sponsor? Or is that... What? I said, are you his sponsor, Mike? Are yeah, you his sponsor? My, Michael's my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's my sponsor, and I'm his therapist. Oh, okay. <laughs> I get what I pay for. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> All right, uh, Ed, uh, we always ask everyone the first time they're on the show, when did you uh, first start reading comics? 
I started reading comics probably when I was about two. My dad, while I was living, uh, I guess I was three. I was living in in uh, in Cuba on the military base there, and my dad um, just came home with a huge stack of old comics. One day, he got all the all the guys that were at the office. He got them to all go ask their older kids if they if they had any comics they didn't want anymore. And so this would have been about like 1969 or 1970. And so I got a ton of stuff from like the 50s and 60s when I was just a little kid. Me and my brother got them. That's cool. And what were your uh, some of your favorites? Um, there was a lot of Marvel stuff in there. I remember the first comic I ever read was like a really early issue of The Hulk or Fantastic Four or something like that that had the cover ripped off. Um, there was a few ECs, but you know I didn't like that stuff as a kid actually. Just seemed weird and creepy when you're like four years old. <laughs> but um, but mostly I remember a lot of Spider Man, a few Captain Americas, but um, mostly like Spider Man and the Avengers and stuff like that. Cool. Well, we'll move right ahead. And we'll save all your backstory for some other time when we have you all to ourselves. But since you're here with Michael, let's talk about your Michael. Let's talk about Michael. Let's talk about. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your work together. Michael, we've called you here together for... <laughs> <laughs> it's an intervention. It's, an intervention. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a phone conference intervention. This is a new thing. It's like fan listing. <laughs> <laughs> intervention. This is going to be a wild ride. <laughs> so, when, uh, how did you guys first start working together? Uh, Can I answer that? Scene of the Crime. Yeah, um, we were both, well, I guess I've been working with um, Shelley Bond at Vertigo for a while on some different things, and um, Ed, I guess you had just done, like, Prez, right? I had done some stuff for Lou Stathis. Um, I did Prez, and I did a short story for Axel. I'd, I'd done some stuff, and they, I, I'd, I'd been doing sort of the Vertigo round that you do, or that you did back then, which was, you know, You'd get one job there, and then you'd pitch for a gazillion things, and then they'd give whatever the job was to Garth Ennis. And, uh, <laughs> and I had gotten kind of sick of that, and Shelley uh, would not, would not, would not take no for an answer, and just continually pounded me to give her more pitches. And so, uh, so eventually, I gave her a pitch for something I didn't think that they'd ever let me do because I said, "Well, this is the last thing I'm pitching," and I pitched scene of the crime, and and uh, and it was approved like the next day, and then. And then, like a week later, she had lined up Michael to be the artist. So, and then twenty years later, we did Daredevil. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. We'll talk to you guys another time. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said, right? Yeah. <laughs> and make ours Marvel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So that I mean, you know, Shelley called me and said that she. Um, she had this great proposal from Ed Brubaker, and I had read Low Life. Um, when when that was coming out and really loved it, but Ed and I had met really briefly, like at a San Diego show, and we didn't really get along that well. And I don't even know if Ed remembered me. I don't remember any of that. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, you don't remember that? Oh God, we oh. met. It, this was back when we were both still at Caliber. We met like really briefly at a party in San Diego, and you were just grousing about something, and I was like, okay, this guy's kind of grumpy. And, oh, I don't uh, even remember that. Yeah, you were probably drunk again. Yeah, um, <laughs> it, was probably, it was one during one of my many blackouts. Yeah, exactly. And um, so anyway, I wasn't really sure about it. And I was like, you know, am I going to fit with this guy who wrote Low Life? And, um, <laughs> you know, then I saw the pitch and I kind of liked it. And then, you know, Ed and I started talking then and we actually got along really well. And it seemed like we had a lot of similar interests. Um, and at the time it was, you know, all about like doing mysteries and, and crime fiction and um, and we really hit it off, and I've kind of gotten along pretty well since then, I think. Yeah. <laughs> this interview. Yeah. Like an asshole. <laughs> 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 the couple thing has really worked well for us. Yeah, I think it's really... And living, it's in, different, living in different states <laughs> is really... It's a plus. Yeah. So how does that collaboration work? You guys talk on the phone, you emails. What's What's the technical oh, side of it all? We're... You know, I mean, mostly it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, we talk we 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 talk ahead of time about like stuff that's going to be in the stories, but but pretty much I write the script and I send it to Michael and he looks at it, 
Michael's almost like having a second editor on the book in a way. Like if if and this was always the case with Gotham Central because Greg and I are working on, you know, four other things a month, and Michael was only working on Gotham Central. So Michael would be the one to be like, well, shouldn't so and so also like do this or you know? So Michael was is always like having extra eyes on the project, but um, really I send it to him, and you know. We've been working together for so long that you know he knows he can look at my script and go, well, I, I want to draw this instead. And you know he he's one of those guys who who I have no problem when he does that kind of thing because he wants you know he still gets the intent of the scene across. Whereas like uh, if a lot of guys would just disregard exactly what I told him to draw, you know, then I'd get kind of mad. But Michael, you always get what you asked for in a, in some way that's like better than what you asked for actually. So. It's it's pretty you know it's pretty it seems like we've been doing it for so long now that it's kind of intuitive like you know I'll write a script and Michael will will, will read it and interpret it and sort of that's what you get. Well, and we both kind of are trying to do the same thing too. I mean, yeah. we, it's not like we're working against each other. Yeah, not uh, at which all. Which I think I think that happens a lot of times with collaborations in comics where you know especially if it's the kind of thing where the the editors put the collaboration together and and the the collaborators never speak with each other. Um, in Ed's in my case, I mean, we want to be doing the same things with, with anything we've worked on. We're, yeah. we're always, we've always got the same goal in mind. So you said uh, you guys have the Secretly same... sneak in things about gay marriage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Rucka does. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so what is that? What You said that you guys are aiming for the same goals and things. What are those goals in terms of, like, what kind of comics you want to put out? We want to make a lot of money. Yeah, I was going to say sales <laughs> figures, money. <laughs> so it's basically a shallow goal, but it's a goal nonetheless. <laughs> 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 about, about making a lot of money and hey, selling just, a lot of copies. You just want to entertain the widest amount of people possible. <laughs> well, that's also known as the lowest common denominator. No, no, no. Wait, or, you guys like the book, right? Which book? <laughs> and I was just kind of trying to subtly imply that you were the lowest common denominator. Uh, <laughs> it went over your head. Yeah, so, <laughs> apparently, um, apparently it worked. Well, now my think, my honestly, my headphones like have that. filters on, so. Yeah. <laughs> I think an honest answer to the question is, uh, you know, we we both tend to, especially when we work together on like a longer form project, we both want to try and push ourselves to do, you know, better work and to to do stuff that that really matters to us. Because you spend so much of your life working on this stuff, you want something that you can look back on with like a certain amount of pride and and you know that you've really told a story actually and. And especially with something like Daredevil, for me, it's it's important to try to to try to approach the book differently in some way or another. Just 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 experimenting formally in some ways with the book, even is is important. Just because it for me, that's one of the hallmarks of of you know what Daredevil did in mainstream comics for me. When you know when I was a kid reading it, it just blew my mind that you know here's this stuff. And I mean, a lot of it's like Eisner type of tricks, but just people. You know, just people experimenting with the form in a superhero comic was was just so mind blowing to me that I just thought, oh, okay, that's a tradition we can sort of keep up in Daredevil. Well, and I think we're both. I mean, more than anything, though, I think really, uh, and maybe I'm only speaking for myself here, but I just want to do the kind of comics I'd like to read. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I'm I'm not just you know kissing Ed's ass here by saying that you know Ed puts out the comics that I like to read. I mean. You know, my favorite book of the last couple of years was Sleeper, because you know, that's two of my favorite creators, and you know, that's why I enjoy working with them, and that's why I enjoy doing these kinds of books. I just want to do the kind of stuff I want to read. You know, that's kind of that's interesting that you said that, because uh, there was a I, I don't even remember where I remembered some article or something or other where there's that whole debate of you know, should writers write for what the readers want to read, or should the writers just write for what makes uh, for what's interesting to themselves, and ultimately. Stan Lee said it himself. I was writing comics that I wanted to read, and yeah. I think if you, you know, what what are your takes on that? You know, should should uh, writers and artists listen to what's going on on the internet and things like that, or just do what's from the heart? Well, I definitely don't think you should, you know, go look on the internet and find out what stories people want to see and then decide to like give that to them. I think that's a that's a way to, you know, maybe make some quick money and, you know. 
which sounds really crass coming from the guy who brought back Bucky and 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 just revealed the third Summers brother, but <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get those from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, honestly, I mean, I I I've done editorially mandated stories you know in my career before and you know michael's been lucky enough to have been kept out of most of that kind of thing but i've had to you know work on stuff that i just don't give a damn about one way or the other and that's not the kind of thing i'll i I do anymore i you know luckily i'm not in the position where i where i'm so desperate for work that i have to but but uh you know for me you should never you should never work on you know you should never take a job if you don't have a story to tell (laughs) We're we're really fortunate though that in the jobs we've got. I mean, yeah. you know, we can we have we have the luxury of being able to say that doesn't sound like fun. I'm not going to do that. I mean, you know, somebody who has to go work at a bank all day long doesn't get to say that unless they just love working at a bank. <laughs> and, exactly. Um, or I have I have friends who you know who who work in comics who aren't as lucky as me and they don't have, you know, they don't have the ability to to you know get the jobs that I've got. And you know, I'm just realizing now that I'm even you know. Not you know, not at that place now where I where I still have to constantly hustle to like try to get to try to get work. But I talked to some friends of mine and I'm like, I was thinking you know just a few years ago I would have probably been like scrapping to try to get that same kind of spin-off miniseries job. But that now I just feel so relieved I don't have to try to find like a way into a story. It's always you know even with like so, something like the X Men, which a lot of people wouldn't expect me to actually you know, right, if you look at Sleeper or Gotham Central or anything, but, you know, I actually, you know, thought about that job and thought, well, do I have a story to tell with these characters, you know, or is this just a big paycheck? And, you know, ultimately the big paycheck won out, but... (laughs) (laughs) No, but seriously, I mean, I did, I did come up with a story that I was like, you know, I'd like to do like a big over-the-top Stan Lee superhero comic, the kind that, you know, that I like to read as a kid that I don't see enough of anymore and i think you know as a reader you can really tell when the creators are just phoning it in to get the paycheck i mean yeah i don't i don't like reading comics like that i mean you know we're you know once again we're very lucky that we get to make that kind of choice but i mean ultimately you know you at the initial question you asked was do you do it for the readers or do you do it for yourself i think that ultimately you're you're going to do the readers a disservice if you're just phoning it in anyway and i think that the readers can tell and um you know it's uh, you know once again too i have to spend you know 10 hours a day with this stuff and if i'm not loving it then what's the point of doing it i'm just going to do a crappy job anyway yeah you're doing yeah, a disservice okay. to yourself no, as well. I, I don't want to do that yeah ultimately when i sit down especially with daredevil so far when i sit down to work on the scripts i'm looking at you know i'm looking at trying to do a comic that i think you know, ultimately, is something I want to. I want to see. I think of scenes like, what? Are, what would I want to see in a Daredevil? But also, I think, you know, I've got to give Michael a comic that's good enough to keep him interested. And then, on like a, a a lesser level, you know, not that much lesser of a level, I still feel like, you know, because I'm so sort of grateful that Brian helped me get this gig and and everything. I also want to do a comic, you know, just because I know he and I talked so much for the last year about Daredevil, where he was going and where I was going to go, that, you know, I want to do, I want to do comics that he likes, too. I think those are, I think of, of Michael and Brian as sort of my prime audience. Michael's like the first audience, because he reads the script, and then when the comic comes out, I want to hear from Brian and a few other people, you know, like if they liked it, and, and, you know, if I do okay with those guys, I figure the readers will like it, too. Yeah. We should mention that it's Brian Michael Bendis that you're talking about, the the writer that just left off of Daredevil. For those readers, uh, listeners out there who who yeah, haven't been raising, who are under a hole, yeah, under a rock. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he's the third one. Yeah, he's the, he's he's next on the list. <laughs> so so the book's been out for almost a week now. What's the response been? It's been great. I yeah. think. I mean, I've been hearing from retailers that. Uh, that have been just having sellouts on it, and everybody at Marvel is really thrilled. And so far, most of the the online chatter that I've seen seems to be, you know, pretty universally positive. If yeah, the, biggest, people, if the, the biggest, biggest complaint is our cliffhanger ending, then I think we did okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the people on the Bendis board have been really supportive, and that's really the only place I go online to see stuff. Um, but yeah, it's. I mean. Everybody's been really great. About, I mean, everybody's been great about it since they announced us being on it. I mean, you know. Yeah. I felt like we had to deliver because the expectations were pretty high, 
Um, but, you know, the fans have just all been great, and, and the response has been really good. Yeah, I was, I was a little bit worried that once we got announced, so many people were just sort of like, you know, a couple people were like, Thing. we were too obvious a choice almost but most people seemed like really like okay that's the perfect team to follow up you know after after bendis and Maliv. but yeah and i was people a little worried that 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 the expectation was going to be so high that that people even if we gave them a great comic would would not think it was great enough but most people think you know seem to think we we exceeded expectations which is great because i think next issue is even better so cool so now that you both have been working with this book for a little while now, what's your experience that you can relate with as far as b working with this character now and, and writing this book and drawing? You know, for it? me, it's too early to tell. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, still too early for me. I've only worked on one other monthly with Gotham Central, and I know that I didn't start feeling like I, I had my feet under me until like issue six or seven. And, I mean, I left at issue 25, and I felt like we were just getting started, for real. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm totally serious about that. I mean, I was really disappointed to have to leave that book, because I was like, okay, now we're ready to go. Now we're really going to get into the meat of this stuff. And, um, you know, hopefully it, it'll feel the same way here. You know, I, I think that, you know, first we're going to have to, have to, you know, paint ourselves out of the corner that Bendis left us in before we can really start totally telling our stories with this character. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I've got, I've got everything. I've got, like, about a year and a half sort of mapped out right now, loosely, and, and uh, every now and then I just sort of mull over certain, you know, certain aspects of it. One thing I've noticed is something that Brian always told me about the book, like, especially when, when he was doing the Murdoch papers, I knew where he was going with the Murdoch papers, obviously, because I was doing the thing that came right after it. But every time he'd send me a script, I'd freak out just a little bit because there was, while he was still headed in the right direction, there was like all this other stuff that was happening that he hadn't mentioned ever. And I was kind of like, wait, you're still going to leave him in jail, right? <laughs> and he, would, he was just telling me that, you know, he'd have an outline for the book and then he'd write the book and sometimes the characters would say or do different things than he had planned. And... I found that happening already with, you know, like by the third issue that, you know, there were four or five scenes in my third issue script that, you know, that didn't end up making it into the script, you know, that uh, they were in my outline for the script. And, you know, just Ben Yurick starts saying something else or doing something else or some character's motivation becomes clear to me and moves in a different direction. And so it's, it's really a book, I think, that it benefits that I've been following the book so closely and, and have been such a fan of, you know, the character since I was a kid, I think. But yeah, we the characters know, we know, really came alive. Yeah, we know these characters so well that, I mean, it's like, you know, for me, I mean, I just love it when Ed gives me scenes with J. Jonah Jameson and Ben Urich together because um, I, you know, those guys just draw themselves. You know, yeah. I don't have to do anything. They're already acting. You know, it's like it's like I'm just kind of, you know, just taking the information that they're giving me and putting it down on the page. I don't have to make up anything. And, um, and the same with Matt. I mean, I just, you know, try to think about, you know, I, I, I can just already see them doing the stuff that Ed writes for him. It's great. So Hello? Uh, okay. how does this different from, you know, you, you, you were on Gotham Central and you're dealing with, with you know, normal people uh, trying to keep the superhero aspect down, you know, somewhat or, or underplayed. Now you're dealing with a super, uh, quote unquote superhero, but does it, does it feel like you're be, you're you're kind of like freer now with your artwork and your writing, or or are you just is it just another tool to use that you're able to tell s sort of the same kind of stories, uh, crime and mystery, but you, now you're going back into the superhero world. Well, no, I think that that's kind of a mischaracterization of it because Gotham Central. Gotham Central was like crime stories and stuff, but they were those were more like character driven, real people stories. Where yeah, it was the, like a character driven police procedural that, yeah, that took place and in that, the world of of you know the superhero as opposed and, to Daredevil. Is like you know that's like, it's like the difference between the shadow and and like you know a crime story. Yeah, well, I think that you know I think. In Gotham Central, the, the superheroics served as metaphors for what was going on a lot with the real people. What we've got going on here is kind of, it's not really a crime story. I mean, it's, this is a story about a guy who's a superhero and what happens when he's a superhero, as opposed to what happens to a bunch of people who have to live in a world with a superhero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, 
pretty much what Daredevil is about is the consequences of being a superhero. Um, what happens if you're a superhero? How does that screw up your life? And, yeah. and that's what the book's always, well, since Frank Miller's been doing it, that's what the book's been about. Yeah, that's true. I think that, uh, also, though, I think there are some elements of it that feel very similar to me to working on Gotham Central, like when we write, you know, scenes that take place at the Bugle or office scenes. Like I, yeah, I, I wrote that in the last wrote, script. I, yeah. yeah, I wrote that in the script. I said squad room scene. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was like, that was just to give him the, the idea of what I wanted, which was, you know, I want the hustle and bustle of the office, you know, and just I, I always loved the way Michael did that in Gotham Central. But, I mean, I use... I think what I learned from Gotham Central and working with Michael, you know, in general, is just using the the wider cast. I mean, Daredevil's got, you know, a cast. I mean, they they get whittled away over the years, but there are, <laughs> there are other killed. people in the book. <laughs> yeah. They all get but, killed by Bullseye. Yeah, they all get killed by Bullseye. <laughs> that, was, that was the guy at the end of issue 82 with Bullseye. <laughs> Um, I, I want. I just want to. Uh, it's not so much a question as as a as an observation. I mean, as a as a fan of Daredevil, uh, the Bendis run was probably the longest consistent, you know, quality run of Daredevil that I've ever read. And yeah, then it's. I think it's probably you know it. It's probably it's definitely the best long run on the book, and I would rank it as higher or higher than the than the Frank Miller run actually at this point. Because I there's. I think I apples and oranges. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I hate to even compare. Yeah, I mean, I still, I don't even rank. I, 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 I don't even put the the Frank Miller, the original Frank Miller run, and Born Again in the same. You know, I think those are apples and oranges. Either. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm very excited to hear that you guys are in this for the long haul because it, it gives me peace of mind. You know, if if all goes according to plan, that you know we just had you know five years of fantastic Daredevil. And now, you know, maybe we'll get another X number of years and it's just, just keep the ball rolling. It's it's really pleasing as a fan to, to know that you guys are enthusiastic about it and you have a long-term goal. Well, I mean, even if, you know, 25 issues of Gotham Central, I mean, that's like one season of a TV show. You know, yeah. that's, we didn't, sure. like I said, I felt like we were just getting started. And I mean, you know, I'll, I hope we can do 50 issues of this book. I hope that people keep buying it so we can. Yeah. Um, you know, that, to me... I don't even know if we could tell all the story we want to tell in 50 issues. I mean, I don't know if we could do all we'd want to do with this character in 50 issues. So I hope we, I hope that it sells well enough that we can stick around that long. Well, see, that's really cool. I mean, that's a recurring conversation we have. Is we, we, one of our, our dissatisfactions often with the industry is, is short runs. You know, oh, yeah. some great creative team came on and did six amazing issues, and then you never heard from them again or on that book. Well, no, see, I couldn't imagine, like, being on Batman for 100 issues. I mean, it's like, you know, they've pretty much all been told. Pretty much every Batman story's already been told, you know. But, I mean, with a character like this, there's just so much to do with him, you know. Or, yeah, it really, I, I've really learned the difference, too. Since I've come over to Marvel, you know, I've, I've been really, really fortunate to work on Cap. And, you know, pretty quick, there was only one Cap book. Like, you know, the first few issues, there was Cap and Falcon. But after that, there's really only been one Cap book. And, and I really like doing the only book with the character, really. I mean, you can count, like, team appearances or specials that someone appear in, but when you're working on the main book, you don't really worry about that stuff so much. And the same thing with Daredevil. I could, it doesn't feel the same as when you're working on Batman, because when you're doing one issue, when you're doing Batman, someone else is doing Detective, and someone else is doing, like, two other comics that month, and none of it feels like, like your stuff matters. You know, ultimately, it's like the best thing that you can do is just be remembered as sort of, you know, one one blip on the map. Well, you know, and I like, think we... oh, so and so did a good run of Batman for a little while. I mean, we're still people are still talking about the Marshall Rogers Steve Englehart run of like twelve issues in 1972. <laughs> well, you know, I think that too. I mean, a lot of the credit for that goes to the people at Marvel because they've really put a lot of trust into us. Yeah. Um, you know, they they've just given us free reign, you know, carte blanche. I mean, you know, this is Joe's baby, and he's just basically let us adopt his baby. And, um, I mean, they've been nothing but supportive, and it makes it really easy to feel like it's your, it's yours. You know, it's not like work for hire. I mean, this is, this is our book. Daredevil's ours. You know, it feels really good. So, Ed, I would, I would this is probably a question for uh, your solo interview, but then how would you justify that with writing an X book then, in those terms, what you said about Batman? Well, I've learned how to. I've learned how to. Yeah. 
<laughs> I've learned how to do that without uh, without basically feeling that way. Like I, 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 what you could never do, you could. I'm doing something with X Men that you could never do in Batman, which is you know, you can't do the Batman book that only takes place during daylight or something. You know, no, you can't do the. I mean, there's no Batman book that takes place outside of the same world. Whereas when I was approach about doing X-Men, I thought about it, and I thought, well, how can I do this X-Men book without, you know, without feeling that same way? Because basically I'm not using any of the same characters as anyone else, and I'm not having it take place in the same setting. Because I was like, okay, well, if you want to read what's going on in my book, you can only get it in this book. It'll be a completely different, like, X-Men experience than anything you're getting in any of the other books. And that, you know, that to me feels justified, but I mean, how different of a setting can you get from, I mean, how, how different of a story can you get from four different Batman books all telling you the same thing, basically, which is that this guy's parents got killed and every night he puts on a costume and goes out and fights crime in Gotham City. No matter, if, even if all four comics are great, they're all telling essentially, you know, the story of the same guy. Do we really need it every week? A lot of people would say no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So getting back to Daredevil 82, for me, being a, a long-time Daredevil fan, when I was picking this issue up and expecting to read it, going along the lines of where it's been set up, I was kind of apprehensive with the whole, Dare, you know, my, Matt Murdock in jail, and you know, because that can be a hit or miss thing. I mean, you can really be solid, or it could something that could fall apart and and take away. And I read the first issue, issue 82, and all I can say is, wow, I I love the way. Everything formulated together. I love all the setup you have brought into, you know, the storyline, which is just added upon what has been brought with us before in the past five years. And dialogue's crisp. The plot seems wonderful. I love the cliffhanger ending. The art's solid. The coloring's just amazing. It's just a great book. It's it's a natural evolution of of what we've been getting, which what has been being produced in the past five years. Bendis' stuff has you know, evolutionized from the time he started on the book in issue 26. And this just feels like a natural extension built upon, you know, what has come before it. And what more could you ask for? X-Men to regular humans is what you're saying. (laughs) (laughs) Bendis' run is like regular humans, and we're like magnetos. (laughs) Homo superior. (laughs) Homo superior. (laughs) You know, I I think that, you know... And all, at the same time, though, I mean, part of that comes from the fact that I mean, we're friends with Alex and Brian, and we ha- we all have similar tastes. And you know, me and Alex, you know, kind of come from the same background. Brian and Ed kind of come from the same background. Yeah, part, we definitely. What them. But it, also at the same time, I mean, I think that Ed did a really good job of saying, "Okay, I'm not Brian Bendis." I mean, there were people on the Bendis board who I said, who I saw writing like, "Oh, it was like you know, I thought for a second I thought that Bendis had written it," and. That's so not true. I mean, I think there was more happening in this one issue than an entire story arc of a Bendis run. But and no slam against days. Brian. I think Brian's stuff was great, but it's a totally different kind of style of writing and storytelling. And I think we, you know, I feel pretty proud of the fact that we came in and said, okay, we love what these guys did. Now it's our turn, you know? Yeah. That's, that's I agree with that. I, I, I wanted, I mean, I, I worked really hard with Brian over the course of the last year, you know, to make sure that our, you know, his ending and my beginning would be a smooth transition. And you know, I always knew that going from Alex to Michael wasn't going to be a jarring transition. You know, their, style, their styles are different, but they move within the same school. You know, I mean, it, Brian, was really, it was hard, though, because I didn't want to be Alex Molev light. You yeah, know, exactly. I didn't want people to go, oh, well, you know, he's almost as good as Alex is. I mean, it was really it was important for us to say, you know, okay, you know, we aren't these guys, you know. Yeah, I mean that was that was why I, that was one of the reasons I chose to go with narration. Also, because I got a guy alone in a room for like half the issue. But, um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we don't do thought balloons anymore unless we're Dan Slot, um, and then we frown upon it. Um, <laughs> okay. All right then. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, you're not. no, I'm just saying. Like, it, it's it's funny. I I, had, I I noticed a couple people like you know. Th- saying they thought that I was just going to be Bendis Jr. and I was, and and that they were surprised to see, you know, that that the book had like a slightly different voice, even even you know, at, if at all. But but uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I felt like I was a little nervous during the first like week of of working on it, and then 
I don't know, I've, once I got to, like, you know, page seven or eight or so, I just was kind of like, how the hell with it? This is my book. Like, Axel had said, you know, as soon as as soon as you can, you want to just piss all over it, all, all over the book and <laughs> just, just, you know, make it yours. And so, you know, I did that pretty quick, I think. Well, I think so, too. And, I, and that's one of the things that the reason why I said what I said is because I didn't want to compare because it's not fair to compare creators or anything such oh, as it that. Is. It's, it's fair. I oh, know we're better. We're definitely better. No, we're way better. Because <laughs> it's all a matter of personal <laughs> taste. So I mean, it's not. But I, not you know, hear this, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even reading, you know, picking up after they left the book, this, even though the story feels like a natural flow to me, it still feels like a different book to me. Not different in a. In a strong way, but it does feel different to me as I'm reading it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That sounds kind no, of no. No, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> well, I mean, the the thing is, you don't get this kind of hand. You don't get this kind of handoff generally in a book, especially not in a popular book. Right. Generally, someone ends a popular run and they end it on a very final note, and then whoever takes up the book after that goes, "I'm going to go in a new direction," and you know what we did instead was give Brian, you know, like. You know, I I was talking to Brian really early when I, when he you know he gave me the advance tip off that he was winding down his run and that if I wanted it I needed to start you know letting that be known and I was talking to him about a few different ideas and I said well one thing that I'd like to do is not just you know immediately try to go in a new direction and hit the reset button and just take this whole Matt Murdock thing further you know and say well what what would be a worse place than where Brian's already put him and I thought oh we'll put him in prison. And Brian was like, ah, I've been, I've been wanting to, to end him in prison, but there's no way they would ever let me do that unless the guy who was following would actually want to write that story. Because he had promised that he would fix the whole identity thing, but then the more he worked on the book, the more he realized that people thinking Matt Murdock is Daredevil is kind of like the new status quo. You don't need to go back to the status quo. Like, after everything that's happened to him, you know, it's... It's not going to be an easy little, you know, like push a button and suddenly everyone thinks he's not Matt Murdock or, you know, Daredevil anymore. And so it was, it was really, it's, I think it's a really rare situation of, you know, everybody working on this thing being friends because otherwise I couldn't have orchestrated something like that with Brian and he wouldn't have gotten to do the ending he wanted to do then. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, I'm, I'm actually probably the only one in, th in this room that hasn't read the Bendis Daredevil run. Oh, you need uh, to leave. Leave now. No? <laughs> yeah. I'm quite proud of that, actually, um, because I was able to come into this with really fresh eyes. I mean... So, uh, did it seem confusing to you, or by, the, or by, like, the fifth or sixth page, did you pick it up? He was like, who's this Matt Murdock guy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've read Daredevil in my life. I just oh, haven't okay. read... And, actually, I, I lie. I did read the Golden Age storyline that Bendis wrote, yeah. because I'm a fan of, like, you know, like, history and... and within yeah. the, the, the universe character the character's universe and, and um I read those issues and I went, Okay, I think I'm gonna wait to read all the rest of them. But now we can't trust a single thing you say. Oh yeah you yeah. can because I'm no, I'm ready to praise you. To lying to so us. shut up. I'm ready to <laughs> praise you. <laughs> you just shaken the foundations that this relationship was built on. Oh that's okay. <laughs> for my for my taste, uh for Michael, I think from what I, and and I am gonna compare to those issues that I did read, I felt that there was so much more kinetic energy from even the talking head section of yeah. this book that I really appreciated that. Um, well, you know, I mean, me and Alex just do things differently. I mean, that's just, you know, we're, I don't think you can compare us. I mean, well, I think no, it's no. apples and our, Alex really wanted to have a real, uh, a nice, a, a really strong real world feel to the artwork. And that was his goal. And he and I have talked about this. And we were talking about doing fight scenes, and Alex is like, well, you, know, you, you got to look at this and you got to look at that because that's what they do. And I'm like, I don't care what they do. Right. I mean, he's a superhero. He can do whatever he wants. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's got to do this. He's got to do that. And I'm like, no, Alex, he doesn't have to do that. He can do whatever he wants. <laughs> and, and, and I can tell, know, I just, can tell that. That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to say. I right. really appreciate that you, you, know, you actually – you're making it your own because right. I can see that. I can see that in the work, that it is your own take on, on – on using sort of similar tools, but this is total, and, and I enjoyed that immensely. Yeah, um, well, it was, I mean, you know, a lot of it has to do with I was given really fun scenes to draw, too. I mean, yeah. you know, it's funny because I'd been thinking, oh, it'd be really cool if I could do a, a scene with, like, Daredevil, you know, chasing some guys on the roofs in the rain. And, you know, I talked to Ed, and I'm like, Ed, man, the first scene, we got to do something really big. And he says, yeah, I'm going to have Daredevil chasing these guys on the roofs in the rain. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, this is going to work. <laughs> 
and um, you know, and I you just said, can all it be adult fighting. age spread? And I said no, and then I did it anyway. <laughs> yeah, that was I had to put my foot down on that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like I'm I'm actually even as we speak, like working on a scene, um, you know, that's just like exactly the kind of like action fight scene I would want to do. And um, so I mean, I'm I'm being given this really cool stuff to do. So it's been really fun, and it's also been kind of fun. Like in um, in '83, there's a sequel. Was it in '83? The end of '83 with the thing where I did the panel with like all the different daredevils, like showing like showing the the whole the whole range of action, like as he's make, doing this move. And oh yeah, gotten, yeah, yeah. You know, I've gotten to kind of stand on the shoulders of some giants that have come before me. I mean, the fact yeah, he did that a classic you know, like Gene Colan esque. Kind of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's you know guys like Gene Colan and David Mazzucchelli, as well as Alex that I can kind of take what they've done and use it as foundation. So I can't really claim credit for the fact that like you know this is all my Daredevil. I mean, this is just me synthesizing all the different things I've seen over the years, you know, from this book that are all influences on me. Yeah, and that goes along with the whole not wanting to go too far into a whole new direction, and and suddenly it's jarring to longtime readers. And yeah. and and it could be kind of for new readers, it could be, oh, well, this wasn't what I was expecting at all. So then they, you also push them aside, too. But it, it it worked on a story level, too. It worked for me that I didn't feel the need to go, OK, I need to borrow somebody's Murdoch papers because I, 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 I want to know the setup or I don't quite get the setup. But it was and a you totally one issue of their stuff and you know he's going to jail. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um. Well, yeah. So, so you were able to you were able to pick up the so, story while just reading it through. You know, when I op- when I opened the first when I opened the cover, I thought, oh look, there's no preview page, no previous page. And then I went, well, that makes sense. This is a start of a new run. You know, well, first I did I did kind of question. I was like, you know, why? I wondered why they didn't why they didn't do that. You know, maybe was that your call, the editor's call? But then I went, you know what? It makes perfect sense because this should be, for me, it was a first issue of a first of a new run. So I didn't. Needed, I said, I'm going to get it in the story, right? So I kept reading, kept reading, got it in the story, got to the ending. I went, great, I'm hooked. Well, you know, that's yeah. one of the things I really like about what Ed's been doing with his, all of his stuff at Marvel is that, I mean, it really does have a classic feel where you can pick up any issue and kind of fall into the story, even with the Cap stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we used the to be... previously pages in that a little bit to help us, but I always try to make sure that, that you know, the story sort of carries itself. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the old days, you didn't have to have a previously page. I mean, you just picked up a comic and started reading it. And yeah. you know, Ed's been well, doing the, a really good job of that. In the, I talked to Frank Miller about this years ago because I, 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 when I sat down and reread like all his Daredevils when they put out those visionary collections, I hadn't read them for probably ten years or so, and I noticed that the first three pages of every issue there was a scene that explained who Matt Murdock was and how he got his powers. It, it's narrated in there somehow. You know, and and sometimes it would be really jarring because it's the beginning of like part three of a four part story, and for some reason it has to open in a fight scene, and some narration in the fight scene has to explain who Daredevil is and what he can do and why and why he's there. And and he said that was the mandate back then that in the, within the first three pages you had to explain everything people needed to know about your about your main character and your story. And I kind of was looking at that with Daredevil and thinking, is there a way we can I can do that, but just sort of stretch it out throughout the whole, you know, like first half of the issue. Because I did, I did the same thing. I just decided to use the page instead of having the previously page because I was like, well, I want to, you know, tell as much story as I can. And if I can fit in, you know, if readers are smart enough to keep reading it instead of just throwing it down when they don't see the previously page, <laughs> then you know, hopefully they'll they'll you know anything that they're missing will be will be in the meat of the of the story. So. That's you know that's been my my hope and that's what I've been really trying to do with Daredevil. I might I might do a previously page at the beginning of like a new storyline or something like that. But I'm I'm going to try and just you know. Continue. This coming from the guy who every time I get a script from him is like, man, I wish I had one more page. I know. It totally. ain't going to happen. <laughs> I know. Well, you, I know. I got I got I got a lot more in the first issue and then I got one more in the second. <laughs> so that's that's an interesting question. I mean, so. When you say you, you, you weasel out an extra page in the second issue, is that did they sacrifice an ad to, to give you more story? I don't is know that... what they did. I asked if I could have an ad. They, they do that occasionally. I've had a couple extra pages here or there in cap when I needed one. I asked if I could you know just take the story a page long. and they so, you know I don't think it's necessarily that common practice. I noticed Brian did it here or there in Daredevil, and so I thought maybe Daredevil, because it's sort of you know 
that was the Marvel Knights flagship book, maybe it got a little bit more leeway. And it turns out, really, it's just a decision that they make based on, you know, whether they feel like the story really needs the page or are you just trying to get another splash page in. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> and Brian was never trying to do that. No. <laughs> no, and neither, and neither am I. I'm, I'm trying to get them out. <laughs> yeah. Can I fit another 19 panels into this story? <laughs> uh -huh. Now, I want to, when we, Michael, when we spoke to you uh, several months back, uh, you had told us that um, some of the plan for this book was to bring back more of the superhero element of Daredevil that had uh, that Bendis kind of put on the side. Um, is that is that still a goal? And are we just working our way out of the last storyline to build up to to superhero the return of the superhero Daredevil? Well, you know, I think we you know there's been people to them so they'd give us the job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think people have unfairly criticized Brian for that. I mean, there was. Somebody, like, made a comment, like, on the Bendis board when this issue came out, and they were like, who's this guy in red tights in my Daredevil? You know, yeah. like, I've been reading it for the last five years, and there was no guy in red tights, and that's just complete bullshit. You know, I mean, it was it was a superhero book the way they did it. Well, I, I um, mean, I, I, you I, won't... I congratulate Brian on making it okay to actually have whole issues of Daredevil where Matt Murdock's Daredevil instead of Daredevil's Daredevil. You know, it's like... It was. I have a, our third issue. I think nobody shows up in the Daredevil outfit at any point, and there was just no room for it. I, you know, there was going to be a scene, but I just couldn't fit it in. And there's so much else that goes on in the issue. I thought, oh, no one's even going to miss it. I didn't. You know, my editor didn't miss it. I didn't even notice. And, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I'm drawing Michael it right now, and notice. I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I didn't notice. But uh, I mean, there's plenty of action in the comic and 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 intrigue and stuff. But I, I think you know, I mean. I, I, I think everyone's pretty happy with the, the, the feel of Daredevil, which is it's sort of a pulp crime superhero mix, and it'll always be that. I mean, I want to, in our second storyline, I want to try and, you know, have a few nods to the sort of old swashbuckling aspect of Daredevil a little bit, but, but really, ultimately, it's, it's a character-driven, you know, crime-slash-superhero comic, and it's always going to be that. I mean, I... I try to probably put more action and, and a little bit more of the character in costume than, than Brian does, probably because, you know, that's just what I want to see out of it. But I, I never I never even noticed when Brian didn't have Matt Murdock as Daredevil in, yeah. in the book. Yeah, I, I mean, know, I, I think, think that's the same person. So. Yeah, I think, too, I mean, the fact that, you know, I'm coming from, like, you know, a little bit more of a different background than Alex, where, you know, I kind of want to do this kind of Gene Colony stuff and things like that, that even, you know, even if we had the same amount of pages of, of him in costume, you know, I think it might still end up looking a little more old school and like some of that old superhero swashbuckling stuff, because I dig that stuff. I thought that stuff was really elegant and, and graceful, and, I, you know, I love Gene Colon's, like, sim simple gracefulness, and I'd love to be able to do more stuff like that. And it's just, you know, it's just a difference in the way me, me and Alex approach the character, you know? Yeah, I mean, personally, you'll get absolutely no complaints from me about you know, the Bendis run. My only complaint is that it, it had to end at some point because I, I mean, no offense to you, and no, but no. I would, I, I would have been fine reading that for the rest of my life. They could be the creative team forever. So I don't, I don't personally complain about the costume, but I mean, for me, the costume looks really cool and it's always fun seeing a guy swinging around the rooftops in New York. I, I never get bored of that. It could be a yeah. whole issue of him swinging around from panel to panel, and I, I would probably love that issue. So it, it kind of excites me knowing that maybe, perhaps one day I'll see more, but I don't complain oh, about yeah. not seeing no, you'll, it. I mean, I think you'll definitely see a bit more of that kind of stuff just because, you know, just because that's, that's the kind of stuff. As much as I love, you know, Brian and Alex's run, yeah, that's the kind of stuff when, when, I, when I would think about what I wanted to do on Daredevil, I would, you know... I would, I, in my head, I see just, you know, scenes that Michael could draw that would look really cool, you know, so. I want to, yeah, man, swinging from lampposts and things like that, that's, yeah. you know, that's Daredevil. That's what you got to do. I mean, it's just the same, like, if you're drawing Batman, I mean, you got to have it, every like. every super spy chick that comes along. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get killed. Yeah, and then they get killed. By bullseye. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny because. Yeah, I was such a fan, and you know, am still such a fan of of you know Brian's run. That you know, a long time, you know, when he was halfway through the run or so, like I would have never imagined following him on the on this book because, you know, who would want to follow like such a great run for one thing? Because that's way more of a challenge than following like whoever follows that guy who screws it up. But um, 
but also just because I just, you know, I couldn't imagine them leaving. But then when he told me they were going to leave, instantly I wanted to do it because I thought, well, if I don't do it, who knows who will do it, and maybe they'll do a really terrible job, and then I won't be able to be reading Daredevil again. You know, it was great to be reading Daredevil again for the first time since, you know, 1989 or something. Yeah, I mean, it's it. I, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, I've had to take my Daredevils and, like, put my Bendis Malev Daredevils and put them somewhere where I can't see them right now because I just love yeah. Alex's artwork so much that I don't want to be imitating him. I mean, I've had to pull out my other stuff, you know, my other Daredevil stuff to look at to get, you know, inspiration and ideas. Because I, you know, I don't want to imitate him because he's so great. You know. Well, if you want to, if you want to not imitate, you could pull out that costume from the mid '90s and bring that back because oh, that'll that'll uh, separate you from from Malev. I think I'm losing my connection here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not even going to respond. <laughs> You're talking about the Iron Daredevil. <laughs> yeah, we had like uh, it had all those metal things, armor uh, yeah, on it and stuff. That was and Mike that Murdoch. Bio. Uh, that was Mike Murdoch. <laughs> yeah. Thank God he's dead. Um. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, really. So uh, speaking of uh, with with plans for the book, it, it, or do you intend to create some new villains? Or are you going to really uh, dig into the uh, Rogues Gallery that's already established? Or. Um. I don't know. We might create if 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 I can think of a really good Daredevil villain, you know, that needs to be there, then 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 probably. But you know, there's so many, there's so much in his sort of world already that you know, to me, it's like I, I have a lot of I have a lot of stuff on my list, you know, to tackle. But you know, I, you know, I always think about that when you when you do something. It's it's great if you create a character and and have someone else use that character. It was. It was cool to me to see the black and whites of, of Wolverine, to see, you know, Winter Soldier versus Wolverine. I was really psyched about that. So, you know, you never know. Michael says no. <laughs> Michael doesn't say anything. Michael's going to draw whatever you tell him to draw. All right. Yeah, we're going to kill off Bullseye and have a, have a, have a new Bullseye that's going to be a girl. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> It'll be Electra. Electra will be Bullseye now. Electro becomes the new bullseye. There yeah. Well, we've actually heard. I've actually seen. I think that's not a bad idea. Oh. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It's a terrible idea. Okay. We've seen some speculation that the new Daredevil is Echo. The 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 imposter Daredevil, I should say, is Echo. No, well, that's you know, not who it is. she could definitely fill out the man's costume. Uh, so. Yeah, she's done it once. <laughs> so far, I've seen. Spider-Man. Forty-five people guess it. Run now. <laughs> I'm ah. Just kidding. A lot of people are guessing a lot of things, and uh, a lot of people are uh, a, a lot of people are guessing some really obvious stuff. You know, it's Matt Murdock. <laughs> there it is, done. There yeah, is. we don't we don't want to know. It's Hawkeye. I want to just it's read Hawkeye. about it. <laughs> it's Matt Murdock's dad. It's it's Matt Murdock's dad. Yeah, He's not go. really dead. <laughs> oh, sh- I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> we'll like, edit that out. Yeah. Michael, I gotta, I gotta bust your chops about something you said earlier. You said that the only forum that you post on is the Bendis board. What about our forum, Michael? Why are you not on our forum? I posted on your forum. Yeah, like, well, my, how many months ago? When's the last time you posted? Uh, you know, I'm putting, I'm putting a spotlight exactly. on you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you just made me really want to spend a lot of time there, <laughs> like, like, like hanging around with my mom. You know. <laughs> When was the last time you called? I can't even remember the last time. Uh huh. Exactly. <laughs> Ouch. You don't even call on Christmas. I guess I'm not going to be sending a link to this to my mom, am I? No. <laughs> not, now. not now that I made her sound like like you know a yenta. Oh. Um. <laughs> what's the first What's the first convention you guys are going to be at together? I don't know. Are you going to San Diego this year or Chicago? We were going to be in Seattle, but I have to cancel that. Um, are you not going to Seattle? I told you that already. You never listen to me. Everything. You just don't even listen to said, me, do you? You said that you might. <laughs> well, why would I listen when all that comes out of you is nags? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you two are married. <laughs> we feel like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, like that, we're like that couple on the Stelladora breakfast treats gag that Pat Oswalt does. I, 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 okay. I, don't, I don't. I think no one in the room has any idea what you're talking about. You have to buy the Patton Oswalt record, the uh, the uncut record from his show in Georgia. If you go on uh, on Patton's website, you can you can buy it. I think it's called 222, and that's how long it is. Two hours and 22 minutes. Hmm. 
Michael has it. Didn't I, da- didn't I dub that for you, Michael? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we gave you that and that Maria Bamford thing. You didn't give me the other one. Oh, I didn't give you the other one? Oh. Well. This is a hell of a collaboration. Yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> Stick the email. Sorry. I guess I gave that to the other artist who was going to draw Daredevil. Oh. <laughs> Are either of you going to New York Con this week? No. Nah. No, I'm not going to be there. I, my first con this year will probably be the, the Emerald City Con. I think Michael and I might. Are we still Are we talking about doing that signing for uh, Michael Malvey on Free Comics Day? Uh, yeah. yeah. Whenever that is. <laughs> Whenever Free Comics Day is. It's uh, May 6th. Yeah, it's uh, in. Uh, what city is it in Arizona? Do you know? I don't know where he is. Let me see. Does anybody know Atomic Comics? No. 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 Yeah, we're going to be doing that. And what? Who else is going to be there for that? Steve's going to be there for that, right? I think that's going to be a fairly big thing because he's, he's like the. I think he's the largest Diamond Comics account. But Steve America. Epting's going to be there too, right? Yeah, Steve Epting is. We're trying to get Steve to go there. It doesn't say on his email. Um, where and it I'm is. gonna I'm gonna be going to probably um, the Toronto Con as well. Oh, that's okay. coming up soon. Yeah, and I may go April. to San Diego, and I'll probably go to Chicago. But um, San Diego depends on on uh, a couple a couple factors still. But now, why would you I not go to San hotel. Diego? <laughs> What'd you say? Why would you not go to San Diego? San Diego's gotten so big that yeah, it's, it's just a mad kind house. of insane. It's like you can get the same, you can go to Chicago and see just as many people, meet just as many fans, and you know do as much like promotion as you would do without having to be like forced into that oven filled with Klingons and. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the Klingons and the Stormtroopers. But, but, but don't but, forget, uh, don't forget the girls in the anime outfits. And those yeah, are the anime girls. Well, that's what turned me off of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's become such a Hollywood kind of thing. Man, we it's could go to jail insane. for looking at the anime girls. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. yeah we're almost forty. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just you know, like last year, uh, from what I heard, it was just you know there was like three conventions going on in San Diego at the same time, and you know that was just apparently just hell. Wow. So. Um, you know, I, I'll, I go to. I like the San Diego Comic Convention. I've been going to it since I was a little kid, but it's just so big now that it that it makes it a little bit harder to go. Yeah, I mean, you it's know. like you, there's. It's just it gets harder and harder to cut through the din. You know, I mean, I think that I can go to you know one of the little shows in New York, and you know I'll be doing sketches all day long, and people know where to find me if they want them, and. You know, the same thing with, like, going to the Emerald City Con. It was like that. But, you know, you go to San Diego, and I just become, you know, one of the faceless, you know, nameless people in the crowd. And, you know, it's like, it, it's just, it's hard to find us and things like that. I To me, it's just not worth it. it. It's an expensive, you know, long time to be away from home. Yeah. The last time I went to San Diego, I just went for, like, I showed up Saturday morning and left Sunday night and... That seemed like almost the right amount of time to go there. I, I had just enough time to like sit down at a booth for like, you know, one or two signings and go to the Eisner Awards and hang out with some friends and then go home the next day and you know, but uh I, I like I like some of the smaller cons. I went to Chicago for the first time last year and and uh you know, there was a lot of it was a much bigger convention than I thought it would be and yet at the same time, you know, it didn't feel like a complete madhouse when you're like sitting there with a line of people and stuff. I can understand that. Well, now that we've groused about cons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, I have to ask you, back in Baltimore, when you were doing my sketch for me, we got to talking about a certain character, which you know who I'm talking about, and you mentioned that yeah, you were going to try to get... we're all sick of hearing about it. You were, gonna, you were saying you were going to talk to Ed, maybe, about getting him in the book. Is that something that you've talked about? What are you talking about? Moon Knight. He's got this <laughs> thing about Moon Knight. He's got an obsession. Like He's got a new comic crush. coming out. Yeah, well, he can make a guest appearance, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. They've you know. already, they already done that. Years Moon Knight figures deal. into all of his fantasies. Well, in the deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. What is it? <laughs> the payola scam starts now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Grease yeah, the palms. Moon Knight, Black, Black Widow, uh, Paladin, Ooh. and... The Moon Knight Black Widow can be like the all black and white issue. Um, yeah. That'd be kind of cool. Moon versus Black Widow. Yeah, I, I like Moon Knight. If they uh, if they weren't having him in a regular comic, I might I might use him here or there. We'll I'll, I'll see I'll see what they do with the regular comic. Somebody says Dakota North's getting their own comic. Dakota North's got a miniseries. Yeah. Oh, cool. 
I knew that. I knew that already. Oh, okay. When we, when, but I had already planned on using her. That's, that was just sort of fortuitous that they were going to do a, a Dakota North thing, and then they, I think they're holding it off so that it comes out after our first arc so that people As know. Well, they should. Again. Everything should revolve around us. Yeah, everything's going to spin out <laughs> oh, of our boy. stuff. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question, Ed. Um, this is we've, – we've been hearing some – Listener reaction to what Joe Quesada said about uh, putting a little bit more info in the solicitations, and uh, you know, certainly, whatever they put in there, you know, you shouldn't really judge until you actually read the book. But we've been, you know, you hear all over the place people just reacting to, you know, oh, they're saying too much, and uh, but don't read the solicitation. Well, simple. well, it's not that simple because you know, for people who pre-order, you gotta kind of look at the the yeah. what's coming out. But I, I wondered don't read what the your for anything. Well, yeah, you don't. You don't read any comics. <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, just the cover alone. Luke. You don't have to. I mean, you know what? No, you, you don't like. have to. You know but who the creators but, are you like? You know the characters you yeah, like? Well, but I, but I, actually, I, when I, I open I up, hear, I hear where people are coming from. You know, but I I you know when I grew up, we bought the comics at the Seven Eleven. You know, when and and then. Even when there were comic book stores, when I was in like junior high and high school, and I go to comic stores, I you know I never looked at a catalog as a comics re- as a comics fan until you know like five years ago when I was living in the country and there was no comic book store, and then I had to order online and right. and uh, and go through the catalog and stuff. So I never had to look at that information, and and it's a real fine line between. You know, how much do you tell the retailers so that they want to order the book because they think there'll be demand for it? It would be, it would be great if there was some way we could secretly tell retailers stuff that fans wouldn't find out until, you know, until the books actually came out. But there is no way to do that because so many of the retailers are fans too, and they'll tell you know a couple of their customers that are sort of their close friend slash you know fan buddies, and then suddenly it's out on the internet. So you know, either way, it's going to get out. So the the thing that we sort of came up with was, you know, revealing more information up front, you know, but so far I haven't, I don't think I've actually revealed anything that would actually, like, damage the story. Like, I didn't, I, you know, ultimately I didn't think the, the leaking of the full cover for the second issue actually ruined anything about the first issue. I mean, there's people going, oh, well, I already knew Foggy was going to die, you know, before I got to the end. And it's like, just because you've seen the cover for the second issue doesn't still doesn't mean that you know anything. Right. Well, you know, and even still, I mean, the fact that Foggy dying wasn't even the most important thing about that scene. I mean, it was more the fact that Matt was powerless to stop it. I mean, there's there's a lot of things you didn't know, even if you knew Foggy died. Right. That, yeah. That, that and, was... and my feeling about it is, that, I mean, I'm looking at this as somebody, you know, who's helping them try to put together solicitations and market my book. And, and you know, they can't, I mean... For a long time, we were going to solicit with no. We solicited the book with no cover image, and we couldn't tell people what was going to be in the comic because we didn't want to ruin the end of Brian's run. And then we all talked about it, and Brian said, "Well, look, once my once, you know, the second to last issue of the Murdoch Papers comes out, we should reveal, you know, because at the end of that issue, Matt was actually in jail, and so he figured, you know, most people are going to think that he's are going to, you know, make the assumption that that's where he's ending up. So." You know, let's go out and, and tell people what's going on with the book next. And, you know, so we were looking at it as being able, like, soliciting blind, basically. Like, just, just trust us that Brubaker and Lark are going to do a good job on the book. So, you know, when that second cover image leaked out, that generated more interest than our first solicitation with us taking over the book, actually. <laughs> you know, because people are like, what, they're killing Foggy? Or did Bendis kill Foggy? Oh, my God. You know, it was like... Suddenly, that was all people could talk about, and my feeling was it was kind of like Hitchcock explaining the difference between shock and suspense. If you saw the cover for issue 83 before you read 82, every single scene that Foggy was in had an added significance because you're going, "Is this the scene where Foggy gets it? Or is this the scene where Foggy gets it?" You know, and and it's like he said, Hitchcock. Hitchcock's example was there's a bomb under a table. If you just show two people sitting down at the table and then the table blows up, it's just a shock. But if you show that there's a bomb under the table before they sit down, every single line of dialogue that they say has added meaning and nuance to it because you know at some point a bomb's going to go off and kill them both, or potentially could. And so, I, you know, 
I look at it. I, I, I'll, it's probably a bit tricky, but but you know we're trying to find a balance between showing people enough in the solicitations that they want to buy the comic, and not revealing so much information that we dist- that we ruin the comic. That makes sense. I mean, uh, for me personally, it was it was the whole. You know, Michael, you said don't read the previews, but like when I opened up the one Marvel previews for X Men Deadly Genesis Four, even before I got to the solicitations, there was a banner across the top that said the secret of the third brother, Summer's brother revealed or something like that. So it was like you couldn't even have the chance to ignore it. And, well, yeah, uh, but but there, but like you said, there's more you, to the story. That's, that, all that does is get people who didn't. And by the way, like the orders for the fourth issue of that like went way up because. Right. <laughs> you know? Oh, I'm sure. I think the orders for the fourth one were higher than the orders for the third one. <laughs> wow. So I mean, it gets it gets, it's something like that. Like, but that doesn't. That shouldn't necessarily ruin the comic for you. I mean, I'm I'm so, I'm I'm sorry if that one does. No, no, but actually, like the what ultimate I... story of of that, you know, the ultimate payoff of that story in the sixth issue, when you find out the truth about everything, you know, hopefully the ultimate payoff is so good that these little spoilers here and there, if anything, maybe enhanced it because you think that something's one thing and it really turns out to be another. Exactly. Right. I mean, yeah. never believe that we're not using the solicitations as a trick as For well. Your benefit, yeah. You know, right. because we might we might be doing that. I mean, I used a lot of Captain America solicitations to lead people away from things, you know, while making them think I was telling them something. Yeah, and most of that was brought up because I wanted wanted listeners to hear your end of the story because it is, you know, as a writer, you know, like as you said, all the story isn't there even though the 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 um that image the little there. nugget of information, yeah. you know, you're you're going to twist and turn it and it could it could be twisted or turned any way. So um, Yeah, I mean, every time they come to me with, you know, we need a better way to market this, we need something that will make people care more about this or want to buy it more. You know, I mean, what we found was that over the course of a number of years, you know, this was a meeting I wasn't even at. I got called about it afterwards. So I know Brian was was part of this meeting, and you know, Joe Casada and Brian both called me to talk to me about it. But basically, they decided they were looking at at you know the way that they solicited their books, and they decided they'd gotten cocky. They were just saying, "Hey, this is going to be a big story. Trust us," you know, and. And they felt like something like Deadly Genesis, if we'd leaked part of the part of the secret without you know without leaking the most important stuff, we could have sold a lot more copies up front. And what it turned out was that you know more and more people were getting turned onto the book as it went along, as opposed to jumping on it right away. And you know, and that they found the same thing when they when they released the the cover with Foggy's grave on it. Suddenly, like you know advance reorders for our first issue like went way up and you know what 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 we found was we weren't giving people enough we were being too precious with every little aspect of it yeah ultimately it doesn't matter we keep saying that word um it doesn't matter in the end you know if we do leak that stuff if nobody buys the book anyway yeah. i mean if you know if more people are going to buy the book then let's go ahead and leak it you know I mean, it, it doesn't matter there's three or four things that are going on in comics that i'm working on right now where the readers think one thing because of either a solicitation or something that we did in the comic, and the whole story hasn't played out yet. There's stuff in Cap, there's stuff in the X-Men, there's stuff in Daredevil, where stuff just hasn't played out. And people just, it were because of the Internet, I guess, and everybody seeing solicitations, everybody just is so far ahead of where of just following the story. Nobody wants to just follow the story and see how stuff plays out. So, I mean, I knew... For you know, for a long time, I was getting a lot of flack about stuff that I knew was going to ultimately pay out in a different direction on Cap, and you know, and I just had to take it because I couldn't go. You know, well, wait, it's not what you think it is, just based on a solicitation. You know, so yeah, I went. I I think I posted like on Newsarama about that at one point, where you know, some people were just grousing about, you know, oh, I can't believe they're going to kill Foggy, or I forget what it was, and I was like, I just had to laugh, and I was like. Man, don't you guys think we have any idea what we're doing? You know, I mean, we know what we're doing. <laughs> no, We've been doing don't. it for a while. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't read Newsarama often enough because he, he. Otherwise, he'd know those people don't think we know what we're doing. <laughs> well, yeah, that's but I why mean, they're there. They want. They think they could do our job a lot better. Well, in any event, I mean, you know, it's like you know, just just give us give us some slack here. We know what we're doing. I mean, we're not going to spoil the read of the book for you by telling you that Foggy gets killed. You know, it's yeah. not going to spoil I, the book for you at all. I don't. Yeah, that was that was one of the reasons I ultimately was okay with it in the long run. You know, when it when I was told that was you know how it was going to happen, I was like, 
okay, well, I guess. And then I thought about it. I'm like, what is it really? All it all it does is it get it takes it takes it takes shock and turns it into suspense. And suspense is far better than shock to begin with. And and really, you know, people knowing, you know, people seeing the cover to issue 82, or you know, knowing about the end of or or, uh, or seeing the cover to 83, or knowing about the end of 82, you know, with the foggy scene, like none of that actually ruins anything that comes after it. None of none of that ruins reading 82, and none of it ruins what comes after it because. You know, me and Michael and our editor are the only people who really know what's going on in this comic, and and you know, and that's not really what the comic is ultimately about. It's about a lot of other stuff. Well, that's why on this show and on our forum, we we really we just stay away from spoilers altogether, uh, and even speculation most of the time because it does breed that kind of you know too much knowledge is sometimes a, d- a dangerous thing, and and yeah. false knowledge well, I have is a even worse. Who knows somebody who who was one of the creators of the show Lost. And that knowledge was a dangerous thing. And that knowledge, <laughs> well, um, and he, he uh, a friend of his found out that he knew the secret of Lost and, and basically, like, badgered him until he, until he said, okay, but you can't be mad at me, you know, after this. And, and it didn't work. They were totally pissed at him for revealing the secret because <laughs> that was one of those things, once you know the secret, it, like, changes everything, you know. But, but... That's because that's the whole gimmick of that show, <laughs> is, that, is that, like, they're parceling out the secret, like, kernel by kernel. So if you know what it ultimately is, you probably, you know, it probably loses a certain amount of its value because of that. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't want to know. Yeah, well, I don't want to know the secret. At this point, I'm actually thinking that by the time they get around to telling me the secret, I won't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm worried like, about it. It's like we were saying earlier, though. I mean, this isn't a book about, you know okay, you know, who's wearing the Daredevil costume? Is Foggy really dead? You know, it's, it's not, that's not what this book is about. This book is about what happens to Matt Murdock because he's a superhero and how does it screw up his life and every life around Yeah, and what are these events going to do to Matt, like, while he's in jail? Like, what is, what is, what is what happens to Foggy do to Matt next issue? You know, and that's really, that's really the question. And, you know, what is Matt knowing that somebody's running around Hell's Kitchen dressed up as Daredevil do to him, too? You know, and and ultimately we will find out who the other guy dressed up as Daredevil is, and it is a guy. I'll give you that. <laughs> Man, you're, you're Ronan, giving away Ronan, everything. Ronan, that was what the book is about. Well, Ronan's a guy, it. right? Maybe. <laughs> well, I I really haven't had anything to add to it because I'm just sitting back listening to you guys talk. I just want to thank you because it was like. When Michael was on last time, I told him I really love Gotham Central. And this was, to me, like putting on that uh, comfy pair of slippers again that was Gotham Central. It was just great to see this, uh, see you guys back together again, doing more than just the little bits and pieces you did with um, Captain America. I, I really enjoyed what uh, what this is, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys do with it in the future. I think, uh, you know, I think we're together till death do us part. So. Yeah, at this point we're stuck with each other. Yeah. <laughs> me and me and Michael. Yeah, there's a couple people who who you know, uh, unless somebody tries to steal them from me by offering them too much money, I'll 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 try to too work with money. forever. Like, more money than you're possibly worth. Like, <laughs> I'm already making way more money than I'm worth. So. <laughs> Marvel doesn't listen to these, right? This doesn't go out anywhere, does it? <laughs> oh, it just stays for our own personal enjoyment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ed, with the with the story arcs and and you know you say you're having uh, you know go from story to story like that. Are you planning to having them at any certain length, or is it just whatever it ends up being is what it is? Whatever they tell me to make for the trade. No. Um. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the trade. Trades are the most important thing. No. Um. Uh. You know, I always try to aim somewhere between five and seven, something like that. It really it really depends. I mean, I. This one I'm trying to divide more cleanly into an arc than most of my Marvel stuff that I'm doing right now. I'm just sort of thinking in terms of meta arcs. Like, you know, Cap is a bunch of different stories that all sort of build together. And, and um, you know, but, but with this, I'm, you know, I am trying to sort of think in terms of, you know, how many issues is this or how many issues is that, just, just, to, just to sort of figure out a way to pull the structure together for myself. But, you know, the first one is, is six. 
but it's it's a pretty it's a pretty jammed six. It's definitely not a leisurely read. It's a ton of stuff happens in that. All vouch for that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of panels on these pages. Actually, yeah, that was one of the things surprised. that I really liked about about the whole prison thing was that I convinced Michael that I because know. he's in prison, we should have as many panels of page as humanly possible to make him <laughs> feel claustrophobic. Then I meant to make Michael feel claustrophobic <laughs> on the page while he's drawing. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> it's working. But I, I, it does work, though. I mean, that scene with Foggy and, and Matt with 12 panels of page where, where, you know, it's just one of them in each panel, really, a lot of people have commented that that scene... You know, the, the one scene I've noticed gotten getting more comment than any other scene in the whole issue is that one panel scene of the kingpin in the shower, which, remember, you drew <laughs> uh-huh, that yeah. panel? <laughs> yeah, that was the last panel like I drew the, for the issue. Yeah, it was the last panel because Michael didn't like his original drawing and, and decided to draw, like, a really gory, like, horrifying, like, kingpin where you can almost see his ass even. If that guy's <laughs> head wasn't there, you could see his kingpin's ass crack, even, <laughs> which would have been terrifying. Oh, but man. That, was... that panel got so much reaction, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe well, it. Well, you know, it was a great piece of writing, though. I mean, I'm going to kiss your ass now. Um, it was a great piece of writing because, I mean... You know, it's Kingpin up against five guys. Well, okay, we've kind of seen Kingpin up against five guys. But no, it's Kingpin naked in the shower up against five guys. It's like, let's make him as vulnerable as possible and still show him kicking these guys' ass. You know, it, it was great. That. I mean, I when it. I saw the script for that, I was like, oh, yeah, perfect. I mean, yeah, he's naked in the shower, and he's still beating the crap out of these guys, and he's, like, destroying the shower to where they have to shut it down to repair it. And Yeah, that's the thing. Nobody you know? nobody seems to have noticed that that's not just a gratuitous kingpin ass shot. It's, <laughs> it's also key to the plot because it's because of that, that that they have the excuse to lead Foggy down the wrong hallway. Yeah. That yeah. was, you know... That Man, was, if we're going to do anything little... gratuitous with, the, with kingpin, I'm going to show his junk. <laughs> <laughs> They don't call him the kingpin yeah, for nothing. I mean, call, like, he's got my an entire innie. torso. No, no. He's, he's got an innie penis. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sucked into the rest of his body. <laughs> There's no room. His balls are like, you know, right next to his prostate. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> now, now, I, now I have visions of the kingpin dancing in front of the mirror like the guy in Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> Till you see, wait till you find out who Kingpin's cell bitch is. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> and you really do find out. <laughs> oh. that's, that's the scene I'm working on tomorrow, actually. Is it? <laughs> yep. Oh, man. Well, now you've wet our appetites. <laughs> he's yeah. not joking. He's, he's entirely serious. I, I am actually, entirely and, serious. But, yeah. I didn't, but I didn't go as far as I was going to and have him wear a wig and lipstick. But, <laughs> but, that would have uh, been kind of funny. Like, yeah, but people wouldn't recognize him. <laughs> Wow. I, I was thinking about having Matt have have a couple of guys like that just to sort of show how tough he is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought they, since they won't let me have him say "God damn it," they probably won't let me get away with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they that's need to wear the, the lipstick and wig since you can't see him anyway. Yeah, but the rest of the prison can. It's a oh, status okay. symbol. He'll tell one to dress up as Electra and one to dress up as Natasha. And... Oh, <laughs> that would be horrifying. And, uh, and the other man, we're, di- would... we're digressing rapidly. Yeah, we've digressed. Oh, we're man, yeah. get edited out, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, this is staying in. <laughs> this, is, this has become their first pay-per-listen show. Yeah, yeah. So next question. <laughs> hey, it's podcasting. We can say hey, whatever the hell question. we want. Can I ask Ed a question? Yeah, please. Okay, my question is, and I can't believe we've never talked about this, but you were talking about meta arcs. I mean, have you got a plan for like, you know, Brian said, okay, I'm gonna out there, I'm gonna out Matt Murdock, and then I'm gonna, you know, put him back in. Yeah, I've um, got the. Do you whole... have? Do you like? Do you know where you're going with the character? Yeah, I know where I'm going with everybody. Can you tell me? Not on Sometime? the phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've told you some of it, but yeah, it's 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 building to bigger things. I mean, some of it's still taking form. You know, I, I found the first like five or six issues working on a book, like you have plans for where you're going to go with it for the next couple of years, and they sort of, they sort of morph as you're working on it. Like a lot of, a lot of stuff that, that I sort of had in place, but a couple things I didn't have reasons for, I kind of figured out over the weekend. Like one of the reasons that I was just sort of linking all this stuff together, because there's, there's stuff that happens in the second and third issues that I knew who was doing it, but I couldn't. But I couldn't remember, or, or for some reason, my mind was blocking me on exactly like what all the details were of why, and 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 it all sort of, you know. I know it, I knew that there was a reason that I had thought of it before, but it all kind of came back together, and, and I was able to actually make it stronger. So, you know, I'm always sort of reevaluating where these things are going. 
Are they going to leave you? In other you? words, he's flying by the seat of his pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I look at it as pulp writing. You know, we're trying to bash out as many pages per day as possible. <laughs> and Penny for word, it, man. And still keep it exciting. Penny for word. Now, are, what were you going to say? Are they going to... Are, are they going to let you alone as far as, like, Civil War and Illuminati go, or are they going to suck Daredevil into a giant Well, the Illuminati crossover. thing is just one issue, and I've read the whole script for that. That doesn't really have anything to do with Daredevil. Daredevil is is sort of is part of the Civil War more than the Civil War is part of Daredevil. Like, like what happened to Matt Murdock is definitely, you know, something that, that is looked at as a lot at a lot of the superheroes as what could happen to them if they don't go along with you know what's going on in Civil War, but he's not as much a part of it um, during the time that it's actually because I mean it starts while we're doing our first run, and you know our first run doesn't take place over the course of five months; it takes place over the course of like five weeks. So, you know, by the time time timeline wise Civil War actually hits, we'll be on to are you know are deep into our second storyline and and they won't really they won't really meet up so no i won't i won't really be having to deal with that until really that's over and you know sort of, i don't even know what this thing is that you're talking about so that should answer you your question right there no. that should answer your know. question right there though yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be it's not going to be a thing where we have like civil war issues of daredevil or anything it'll it'll be something that's much more dealt with like post our second arc because you know we'll have to at that point but i other i can't really i can't really say any more about it without like spoiling the end of our first arc and no no that's fine that's fine what is about cool great guys well uh we're, we're looking at an, an hour and 18 minutes already so i think uh you know we'll probably let you go because we've wasted enough of your time but we really appreciate uh the conversation has been wonderful and uh, all right we and uh, we, book? yeah, the book was fantastic, and Thanks. we'd love to talk to you again. You know, oh, wait, maybe... who was it that said they hadn't read any of the Bendis run until other than the Golden Age? Then? That was Peter. That's me, Peter. So are you going to keep reading our book now, or? Yep, I picked up the first issue at the lo- my local comic shop, and I added Daredevil to uh, my pool list. Okay, are you are you reading Cap? No. <laughs> Got you know, reading Cap, man. <laughs> you know what? I'm I'm the kind of reader that sometimes. Especially because I, I I'm mostly a DC guy, I'll, I'll, uh, and my Marvel I had to weed out, and you you don't want to hear any of this. But when that no, cap when the Captain America storyline <laughs> was going on, I kind of you know there's so much hype and build up on, on message boards, and everybody wants me to read it, and I'm like you know what if I read it under pressure, I'm not going to enjoy <laughs> it as much as I as I as if I just sit down with all with the tray with all the issues. Give it a fair chance and read it because I know it's good. Everybody says it's good, so all right. l- let You're me really decide. You're really gonna like it. It really is good stuff. I it's, mean, oh, when, I know. when Ed calls me and says, "Yeah, I'm gonna be writing Captain America," I was like, "What? Yeah. You're writing Captain <laughs> America?" And then I started reading it, and I was, it was like the most natural thing in the world. It's it's that's you know one of the best comics out there on the shelves. Well, right it also, you bet. It also goes down to personal taste. I'm not a huge fan of what Steve Epting's doing with his artwork nowadays. Uh, with that, oh really? S- yeah, he's, slipping he's one in. of those guys. That I just think just gets better all the time. Yeah, yeah. The the, the photo he's knocking the ball out of the park with every issue of that. It's, yeah, he's he's really, the storytelling is so solid. It's such good stuff. But Mike Perkins is coming on here for three issues that starts uh, Wednesday. His first issue, and man, he he used to sit next to Epting at uh, at CrossGen, and and he really learned. You know, he's really bringing his his A game to this stuff because he's sort of like, ah, uh, you know, I'm following Steve. But, uh, you know, they, I, I don't know. I, I think it, Steve's one of those guys. I, I know a couple people uh, who weren't huge fans of his before, you know, friends of mine who, who liked his stuff but weren't huge fans that now think he's one of the best guys in comics just having, you know, because they've been reading Cap and, like, every issue they start to like his stuff more and more. He's, I think he might be a little bit of an acquired taste here or there, but I think he's, you know, I think he's dynamite. I think he's, he's probably the best cover artist working in mainstream comics right now, and nobody... Nobody really ever talks about it, but man, he's the only guy going that I can think of who can really just pull off a montage, like you know, like that you just don't even think about what you're seeing. If you're just like, oh wow, that's a montage. Believe it or not, I really liked the, <laughs> I really liked his artwork back in the days when the Avengers wore all those brown jackets. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, he hates that stuff. I'm <laughs> sure he does. <laughs> he really, he really likes the stuff that he's doing now. I think when he gets to ink himself more, and mm-hmm. I, yeah. I think. He's one of those guys I just learned, you know, and Michael saw this, like, you know, I'd give him crazy stuff to draw in fight scenes, 
and you know because I didn't know him that well, so I was giving him stuff, you know, very specific stuff, and he drew it all. And I was like, wow, he drew all this crazy stuff. I told him to have him kicking some guy and throwing the shield at the same time and hitting some other. And it's like, and somehow he made all that stuff work. So I, I really latched on to him. I'm not letting him go either. <laughs> Yeah, he spoiled Ed. Now I now I have to draw everything Ed writes. So, <laughs> yeah, now you know, he now he has to draw fight scenes. He's coming. So I gave you a, I gave you a double page spread, so that makes up for it. <laughs> <laughs> and then eighty seven panels a page later on. <laughs> yeah, eighty seven panels a page. And then I made him. He had to go rent. He had to go rent like some Jet Li movies to see how to do how to do backflips and fighting. <laughs> Are you kidding? I didn't rent Jet Li movies. I posed for those, man. <laughs> oh, boy. At your Kung Fu class. <laughs> Kung Fu class. I'm a master, my friend. Do you study Kung Fu? Grasshopper. No. Oh. <laughs> I'm a comic artist. What do you think? I get up off my butt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, hey, thanks again so much, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. All right, man. Okay. Yeah. All although right, we've thanks. just we've just banned ourselves with our with our talk. No, not, yeah, at, not all. at all. Not at all. <laughs> all right. Talk to you guys later. Well, thanks for having us on. Hey, yep. you're welcome. Right. Good luck. All Take right. care. Bye. See ya. Bye bye. <coughs> wow. That was our longest interview yet. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He deservedly so. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I knew when having them on, it wasn't just going to be. Let's just talk about Daredevil 82, and we talk oh, for right. 15, 20 minutes, and that would be the end of it, you know. Or like a yes, no answer. It was gonna yeah, be... right. I mean, hey. that's you, they have a collaboration. I mean, so you're gonna get that, and, and you can truly see the rapport they have with each other. So, tell they like each other. Yeah. We're gonna just squeeze in a stump the Rios, and then we're gonna end this bad boy because this is a mammoth episode. You know what? I I have to say though. I, I'm proud of the fact that I haven't read Captain America and that he asked me that because you know what? I could be one of those readers that loved it just because it's Ed Brubaker or loved it because it's, you know, everybody's reading it and go, yes, I read it. I loved it. You know, I, I didn't read it yet. So much hype around that. I want to read it on my own. I didn't know? read it until the hardcover came out. I right. didn't read it monthly. And, you know, it's I, freaking phenomenal. Oh, I'm sure, it is. Damn I'm it sure is. it is. I'll get there. Hold your horses. All right. This, uh, this one's from Mathis on the forum. Oh, yeah. Question number one Marvel. In the 1992 series Warlock and the Infinity Watch, the six Infinity Gems were divided between Warlock and five other Marvel characters. Who were they, and which gem did they each have? The gems did change hands a few times during the course of the series, but the answer I'm looking for is the initial distribution. Yeah, um, Adam had the soul gem. We, we already had a, a, an Infinity Gem one the other, the yeah. other week. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's mine, soul time... Power, space, and reality, I think. Soul, space, mind, time, power. power, space, reality. Yeah, that's six. Okay, so Adam yeah. always had the soul one. That's right. And then I'll give Thanos power. Uh, who the hell? Is, can't forget Pip. Which one would Pip have? Is it Moon Dragon? Who is the? What's the green chick's name? Yeah, the Moon Dragon. Yeah, the bald. No, no, no the, gre the green oh, Gamora. one. Oh, Gamora. Yeah, Gamora. That's right. They're gonna yell at you for just yeah, saying. Yeah, anyway, I, this I is was... suddenly this isn't Stump the Rio. I remembered it from Infinity. i um, from the inf in Infinite. Go what is it? Infinity Gauntlet. Infinity Gauntlet. Yeah, where they all got reborn. <laughs> Infinite <would've> something. <laughs> I'll give her the mind one because I think she was the Moon Dragon. Pip. Um, time. Who the hell am I missing? Uh, Drax, space. Maybe it is Moon Drax. Who, who? Wait, I'll give Gamora reality. That's not right. And Moon Dragon mine. Yeah. That's not right. I, I can't think. You of have it. All right, you have Adam Warlock is the soul gem. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Moon Dragon is mind. That's correct. Gamora is time. Nah. Thanos is reality. Nah, Drax is power. power, and Pip is space. Okay. So, because Drax is just the big thug, right? So that's right. why he got the power gem. Big dumb guy. Yeah. Question number two: Independent. In Stuart Moore's Para, an experimental particle accelerator breaks the dimensional barrier and allows communication with an alien race known only as the Para. In which state was the particle accelerator located? Wow. Texas. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Yoink. <laughs> <laughs>
back. <laughs> right out of the anal canal. You had a one in 50 chance. <laughs> Go buy that lottery ticket, Rios. What is power? 2%. Two percent. Huh? What is power? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've heard of that. I've never read it either. I've heard of hey, Stuart Moore, but I've never. It's a six-issue miniseries in 2004, so there you go. Is that independent? I'm, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, question three, DC. In the final issues of 1994's Fate, Kent Nelson and a young girl are merged into a new Doctor Fate, one controlled exclusively by Nabu. Following his defeat, Kent and Inza Nelson are cursed to walk the earth forever as unquiet spirits. Jared Stevens and Alan Scott then begin a quest to get the Nelsons admitted to heaven. Which members of the JSA do they visit, and who eventually gets them into heaven? Wow. (laughs) Follow that one. 94, so who was alive then? Um... I'll say they visit Ted Knight, uh, Jay Garrick, and Ted Grant, because those are the only ones who, and the Spectre put him in heaven. All right. You got Ted Knight, Jay Garrick, uh, the Spectre, Jim Corrigan, and Johnny Thunder. Uh... And it's a combination of Jared shouting his mouth off and the Spectre's plea for mercy that results in the Nelsons getting into heaven. So you're mostly right on that one. 30%. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're more than 30%. Six, yeah, like 60, okay. 60, 70. 70%. I'd yeah. say 70%. 90 on uh, We don't know. <laughs> Score! I got Texas. So, <laughs> so there you go. That was, those were some heavy-duty questions. Yeah, that's for sure. Good, good stuff. Cool. Math is kicking my ass. Wow. All right. I think we better wrap it up. Uh, a reminder that this episode of Comic Geek Speak was sponsored by the New York City Comic Con. That's this week, uh, February 24th, 25th, and 26th. Get your Jacob there. Javits Center in New York. Come see us, Mike Norton's booth. I'll get your whole body there, not just your ass. Yeah. <laughs> not only in Mike Norton's booth, but and unfortunately we, we just haven't been able to set up the times for this stuff, but uh, Mike Norton... Uh, we're going to be talking to Top Shelf. We're going to be talking to uh, Sal at Mercury Comics Atomica. Um, uh, Seppuku, the frag doll, she's going to be there both uh, both nights, both days, I should say. And uh, I'm missing one. Oh, Devil's Do. Devil's Do. So we're going to try to get that posted on the form in the news section somewhere before the actual con. And then you can check us out at some of those places. We'll be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, we're all over the place. We're like multiple men. Or a fungus. We're not sure which. <laughs> uh, if you want to send us an email, it's comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. And our website is comicgeekspeak.com. Thanks to uh, the guys at upallnightgaming.com for hosting the website. Uh, big thanks to uh, Ed Brubaker and Michael Lark for joining us uh, today. And uh, we're begging you to vote for us at Podcast Alley, comicgeekspeak.com slash vote. Um, a reminder that we are brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com, your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment-related columns, contests, features, reviews, news resources, and more. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. 